Dr. Richard C. Miller, your book, Resurrection and Reception, is a heck of a book um, covering so much. And one of the things that it covers is this ascension idea. I had never really put any depth in my thinking on how Romulus ascends, Jesus ascends, and the closest, even Delcy Allison Jr. admitted, the closest analogy to Jesus' ascension is Romulus. There's no other, uh, Christian apologists love running to, well, Elijah got taken up on a chariot, or they find some precedence within the Jewish tradition to try and answer this problem, but nobody comes close to Jesus. So um, introduce us to translation fable ascensions. What is it? Why are they going up? What What is the whole deal? Fill us in. Well, yeah, up until this point, I think uh, from what I saw in my own research, normally a census, the, uh, this idea of ascending up to the heavens uh, was seen as sort of this, the single signature idea behind translation. That that's what it implied. And what is translation for people who don't know? It's a bodily transformation. Your, your, your body is going from its current state into becoming a God-like body. Okay. Okay. Now, manifestations of that or evidence of that can come in any number of forms, whether you're able to walk through walls, whether you're able to appear, disappear, um, appear as someone you're not, whether you're able to ascend up to heaven or, you know, any number of those things, any kind of manifestation that, hey, this person is like Athena or this person is like so-and-so that's able to come back and forth between the two worlds. Castor and Pollux, the Dioscuri, for instance, one of them is born uh, or one of them is given uh, deification or given a translated state, the other not. And they decide to uh, kind of meet in the middle so that they both, and it says in the text, so that they can, that, so that they can both go between the two worlds. And so that's the, and so basically the one brother shares with his other, his twin, this ability. And so they kind of even out each other's status in, in that way. And so it's kind of an interesting way to look at that. Um, so ascension would then happen as a way to signal, hey, this is a glorified figure. This is in our hall of fames, as it were, in the ancient world. And, and so this is a person that didn't go down into Hades. They're not down there uh, with the shades in, in Hades dealing with whatever's there. This is a person that has been elevated to, the, to be among the gods. Now, in classical antiquity, that meant Olympus was no longer on a mountain, just like Yahweh was no longer on a mountain. Um, they're up in the sky now and people had already investigated all those mountains and figured out there's nothing there. <laughs> and so the heaven basically, or the, the blessed place ended up becoming up in the sky. And so at that time then to ascend meant to go and join, join the gods, whether it was literal or not. I, you know, no, I don't think so because this is a literary motif that's happening over and over again. Something like, uh, you know, not to make fun of it, but if you see in a cartoon, uh, you know, uh, someone dies in the cartoon and then they're strumming a harp and they're floating upwards and this kind of thing. Yeah. It was a little more serious than that, but, I, you know, not, I think, I think moving that direction though, that, you know, gr or grandma's looking down from us on us from above, this kind of thing is, is, is she up? Is that where grandma is up? Is she looking at us with her real eyeballs? Or right. She, you know, there's different questions that you can start right. asking, which, which some of the myths, Hercules is literally <laughs> after he burns his body, his physical body, he's having kids, you know, up there on Mount Olympus. And you're like, dude, you just burnt everything, including your stuff. How are you having kids? Well, it, it doesn't just, need to be rational. It doesn't need to make sense. But in some way, the mythos and cultic kind of concept makes sense. So Jesus yeah. fits into this category, you're saying, with him ascending, and which is why right out the gate you have several cult followers, and I don't mean it derogatory, like cultic groups of Christianities that see him as divine in some way, which later gives birth to a concept that we find that unites the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But right now he is in the category of a god or demigod, right. correct? Yeah, well, the translation fable, the, what I, I call it a fable because that's what Plutarch calls it. He calls it a muthos or a, a, that they're mythologizing, which gets translated in Perrin as fable or fable writing. And I don't mean that in the same as like Aesop's fables or something like that. I mean it is, is a, fabu, a, a fabuli, you know, this is among the fabuli of the ancient world. And so basically, in other words, it's a tale and a, that has a certain sacred purpose to it. 
And so in this case, you've got the conclusion of the gospels with this, right? And so the conclusion of plot. Now you could make the case that Jesus is ascending at the beginning of Luke, but that's almost kind of like a Luke Acts. That's their way of bridging the, the story over. Mm -hmm. Basically though, when you're ending someone's, at the conclusions of someone's career, if they're to be elevated in a text, it's the end of plot for that particular you know, storyline. And so that's unique to the translation fable and doesn't really have any connection with resurrection in any particular writing that we know of. And so, you know, other people were raised in the ancient world from the dead. And that it doesn't mean that they're that that's the conclusion of the plot, nor does it mean that this person should be, you know, worshipped like no one's running around starting a cult of Lazarus and trying to, you know, create veneration and worship for the same fact Lazarus goes on to die again. That's not what's going on in the Gospels. So, let, so this is a very important point to kind of parse out for people yeah. viewing. Resurrection, that term that we have in Greek, which kind of has a Jewish context to it that Paul yeah. uses, is the idea that the body, it's, it means to like stand up. The body comes back. It's rising up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this debate, and this is important that we're getting into this about is it physical body or is it spiritual body, which we see as a debate some people argue. Um, we don't have to die on that hill. The idea is when Paul says he died, was buried, rose, went up, and then this idea is that he he ascends. Is Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 kind of giving this idea? Because you're saying several figures, not just in the Jewish world, even in the Gospels, are resuscitated. They, they are resurrected, technically. Yeah. They rose back up. Nobody's worshiping them. Nobody's making cults around them. They right. come back. Eventually, it's assumed they die like any other human. Right. You know, well, the, there's, I mean, if we go to Asclepius, if we go to Heracles, if we go to Apollonius of Tyana, all of these guys ascended in one way or another. And they also rose other people from the dead, just like Jesus. And so those are those are some analogs that are out there in the cultural world that, that were huge, much more popular than Jesus at the time that these, these stories circulated and would have been well known. Um, yeah, I, I do considerable work in the book and I would point people to my book. I, I unpack this idea, like, why are they calling it a resurrection then? What, what's going on in the, with the early Christian movement? What's going, and so my argument there is it's nominal, that they, that, that, that the signals, the literary, linguistic, semiotic signals of this text are littered with translation language up and down. In fact, that all of these post-mortem appearances and touch me and all of this stuff is trying to deal with translation. It's trying to register this with, in no uncertain terms, that this is what we're doing. We, we are exalting him through this protocol. Now so, it's a Near Eastern installment of that, but they're calling it a resurrection rather than translation. Yeah. Emphasizing a point you brought up, I just recently had, it was a revelation from Dr. Miller's work was that when you have these stories of like, don't touch me, I haven't gone to my father to be glorified or uh, touch me, Thomas, know and see that I am flesh and blood or flesh and bone, the term is in, yeah. in, in Luke, whereas flesh and blood in Paul gets emphasized to say, this guy isn't real flesh and blood. Uh, yeah, this yeah. physicality argument, right? That people have, you're, you're suggesting that the, that translation fable, if we don't just look at Jesus and we go to other figures, the fact that they had a body after they died and ascended, meant they were worthy of worship. They were a deity or deified. Mm -hmm. So this would have signaled, which is why Thomas touches and then goes, my Lord, my God, and then worships him. It's right. not about, I touch him, oh, our creeds are affirmed four centuries later. <laughs> like, yeah. he's physically in the same body and the actual That's flesh and blood. Right. And we will one day as well be physical the same way. Even if one could argue to try and make the case that one day maybe they think there's a mass resurrection where we'll be also like his state in a deified form. Yeah. That is kind of the expectation some seem to have that we will also become like him. But it, that's not, we've made a lot to do out of that. And you're mm -hmm. saying we've missed the boat a little? A lot, a, a lot. lot. We've okay. missed the boat a lot. So he's eating <laughs> broiled fish. He's, what is this? It's, they're trying to demonstrate something there. They're trying to make sure if you go to Luke even, you, and if you go to John, they're trying to demonstrate that he's not a spirit. He's not a ghost. This is an apparition. We're touching him. We're feeling him. He's eating food in front of us. And yet at the same time, he's walking through walls. He's able to disfigure himself in, in appearance such that people can't even recognize him anymore. Uh, and he's ascending up into the clouds. And so 
these are all the markings of only a God can do those things. Only a God. Mm -hmm. And so the idea, now you might make the case that some of the apostles later had different kind of uh, permutations of this in, in lesser ways, and they were divinized with kind of a lowercase d mm -hmm. in some way. But they really do work in the Gospels to make sure this is registering as clearly as possible what they're doing with Jesus, that he is being exalted through those standard protocols. And uh, and that's where you get into, we can get into 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, people that rose from the dead in the ancient world didn't have appearances, you know, I, we already know Larry or Lazarus or you, the, the, the widow's daughter or whatever. We already know if you go into Apollonius of Tyana, they didn't have appearance. He rose someone from the dead in there as well. There's no, there's no appearance stories. There's nobody the fi in the 500 saw him or there's no work being done around that. So what you get at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 falls right into my thesis in so many ways. And that is that in the ob observed uh, phenomenology, many of these stories had these signals in them. They had trans, they had, uh, appearances and then they also had eyewitnesses. These were translations. In fact, Paul would have had to do great work in that text to undo that particular pattern and say, but I know you know about all that happening all across your empire and culture for the last 500 years or so, but this is different. So you're just, <laughs> I want that to sink in right. for the viewer. You're suggesting several other cultic groups, whether they be the Caesar cult, whether they be Romulus, whether they be some of the sons of Zeus, had post-mortem of that demigod, hero, figure, god, whatever, appearances. Yes. And eyewitnesses who claim they saw, who said, I saw him on a road. Uh, and I want to emphasize something that I think is important. Jesus does too. Look at Luke. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians 15, but look at Luke. The road to Emmaus, he appears. They don't recognize him. All of a sudden, boom, they see him breaking the bread. And it's, I think, a signal to the cultic practice of Eucharist uh, teaching. I think okay. that is the, the, the etymological here it is. You want him? You want his presence? Eat and drink his flesh and his blood. Right. That's what I think that whole story is about, even though it does tie into the translation fable. It's the cultic thing you're talking about that's powerful. Right. But then... Paul's on this road, and man, have I heard this one enough. He really did see Jesus on a road, and it's like, dude, the same author who wrote that, like, almost what sounds ghostly post-mortem appearance that we also see with Romulus and other Caesars, you name it, eyewitnesses who saw them after their deaths on roads and stuff. Here's Paul yeah. on a road, seeing a deified figure from heaven, bright light blinding him. Who are you, Lord? It is me, Jesus, whom thou persecuteth, etc. Right. You can't tell me this doesn't walk like a duck. Anyway, here I go with the duck. Yeah, thing. no, it's a, it's a theme. It's it's one of the sub themes that I that I list there. I think I give maybe eleven, but recurring theme. And and it starts in Romulus, the the Julius Proculus story, where he's basically steps forward and, and gives sworn, sworn testimony to having seen Romulus in his ascended state and in, in his translated state, meets him on the road, has a discussion with him, receives a great commission, go ye therefore into all the world. And, and of course, he's going to tell him to go do something cool for the Roman propaganda and not for the gospel, but um, it's very, it, it falls lockstep in there. And so, Yes, you, you end up with uh, basically a road encounter and with Paul, he almost gives the quintessential road encounter. I mean, there's the Emmaus one, obviously, but the Pauline one, that's, that's the pivot point, the fulcrum of his story, his sacred kind of biography as, a, as, a, as a, an early legendary sort of figure in, this, in the movement. So, and so yeah. you would just kind of like draw that line backwards in a way with continuity, even though the story is different. Paul doesn't emphasize that glowing light road experience. You're suggesting, as again, heuristically looking at other gospels, other acts fictionally, and going, here's some legends and folklore and, and translation fable and all that. We're working backwards. We're in the gospels and acts, also the same thing. Then we get to Paul's letters, and this is where I was confused and others don't get. Uh -huh. He's like, like, he has eyewitnesses. He has a death, burial, and then he uses the term resurrection. So why do you think he uses that term there rather than metamorphosis or some other term to describe? He just went up. Because that was what was more important to him. 
he, the, the point of the chapter wasn't to try and make some historiological long case about the, the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. That was not what was going on there. He, he skips, he gets, he, he makes his first couple points, but only as a springboard into getting why, into his pet theology, you know, his signature theology. And as a, as a former Pharisee, at least that's how he's portrayed in the, in the text. He wants to advocate for resurrection of the dead in, in, in the eschatological traditional form as it was understood in Judaism that at the final day of judgment that there would be some sort of collective or mass resurrection and people would stand judgment, you know, and receive their, their kind of sentence or whatever, their reward or whatever was going to happen in, in terms of their afterlife. And so that's a final day of judgment. And he wants to get into that and he tries to argue, hey, look. Now, we already know there's a couple different teachers, you know, one waters, another plants and this kind of stuff. Apollo does this. This is this is it going on in Corinth. He wants he was trying to reconcile things under his pet idea and trying to make sure it's all aligning there. Obviously, if you read between the lines in, in the Corinthian correspondence there, he's having a hard time doing that. <laughs> that this is off the rails in all sorts of directions. This is a, you know, if you go back to Corinth and take a look at what that is, and this is shocking, I think. And here I would challenge my, my New Testament colleagues or whatever. Have you read Pausanias? He want, went through Corinth and took a good look at it. He gives a, a detailed description of what this city was like. And uh, that's where the, the, the letter was written. It was written to people living there. Unlike the Gospels, we know who the readers were, more or less, of these texts. Why aren't we studying the hell out of Corinth at this point? As a pro why, why is it that we could go to New Testament programs all across the country and no one's reading Pausanias? And you have Pausanias right here. I think. Yeah, yeah, you know, I do. I've got the low volume here. Why aren't we doing that? It's because I think our project isn't to try and contextualize it fully. That's a scary project in its own right. And I don't know that a lot of New Testament people are heavily trained in that. Master's degree programs, and they're not reading Posamius's trip to Corinth in his detailed description. He walked around Corinth and took notes. He, he talked about what the city, and it was chock full of myth. Think of modern Kathmandu or something like that. People are held to be deities. There's cults on every corner. There's superstition is rife. There's also, this is percolating. It find, defines the architecture of the city, all of the statues and symbols. It's just chock full of that. You've got nearly a million inhabitants in the first century. Even the most modest estimation would be half a million. So we've got a lot of people stuck in maybe a four or five square mile area. Yeah that are constantly faced with all of the religious cultic activity. And if you go and actually read Posenius's second book, which, he, which is him, his trip to Corinth, um, you'll, get, you'll get a very vivid and very dense kind of picture of what the bustling life like culturally uh, was for people that lived in Corinth. These are the, this was where that first church plant was at. And these were people that lived in Corinth that had been swimming in this for a long time before Paul showed up. And Just so, to emphasize something about this that you brought up about, his point is not arguing what Christian apologists are technically trying to do with this text. And that is Paul saying, like, if Christ be not raised, you know, we're, we are stuck in our sins left. And, you know, so the whole point they want to know is that Paul's trying to emphasize Jesus' real literal resurrection, this is historiographical, like it really happened, and that's what modern apologetics is trying to say, because if he wasn't literally raised in the literal sense, and actually this kind of ontological way of not seeing it cultic or mythic, um, we're still stuck in our sins. That's kind of how they're painting it. And you're suggesting yeah. the context is, maybe Paul is saying that as the cultic belief, but like it's like the context is not even that. Is is Paul trying to eschatologically convince, like he does in First Thessalonians? Look, 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 I get some of your loved ones have died. Yeah. We get that, but don't worry. We who remain, and don't worry, they're going to be the first to go up. But like they, there is this resurrection of our bodies that's going to take place. So he's using Jesus as this translation kind of fable trope and incorporating a resurrection idea to kind of validate. Don't worry, we'll also be raised because Jesus was raised. But yeah. then he ascended. What? What do you? How would you say about that? Because yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, for to... those of you that are accepting, it, basically Paul's argument is something like there. Some say there isn't a resurrection of the dead. You know, we could we could see some other traditions that might look like that in early Christianity, a more mundane kind of Jesus. In others are say are willing to accept that there were appearances, and so he goes there with it. And so he what what he's trying to do is pull people into okay, if you're accepting any of this then come on over to my side and accept resurrection of the dead as an idea and in terms of an eschatological idea. And so some are saying that doesn't exist, that there is no resurrection of the dead in terms of uh, eschatological resurrection is what he's referring to there. He's trying to say, look, you already are accepting that he's translated and we all are going to, let's just call that a resurrection of sorts. Right. So, so they're already so come, come, if you're already accepting that, then come on over. Now, it's it's not that um, if you you know if if Christ was not raised, then then we're wasting our time and this is all stupid. I don't think that's quite what he's saying there, and that's often how it's how it's interpreted. What he's saying is you're still dead in your sins. Your faith has been pointless at this point. You know you're still you're still dead. In other words, you're not raised. And so there was this idea that, and you see it in John, even this idea that the resurrection, oh, you mean at the end of the, at the end of the age? He said, I am the resurrection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Whoever believes in me is basically, it's now, you know, you've already, you're already there. So you, already you are transformed. Yet. You're reborn, you know? And so there's some of that going on there, but basically he's, he's doing some rhetorical tricks there that aren't, aren't exactly logically sound to try and get people on, to, to come aboard with his pet theological idea. And that's really what he's after. It, it, as you look through early Christian texts, a lot of the kind of feuds and battles over resurrection wasn't about whether it happened or not. That that kind of a discussion doesn't even seem interesting to people. What what it's was what, interesting? What yeah. kind? <laughs> yeah, it was what kind of body. And that goes into, that's hitting the philosophical, philosophical fray of the ancient world that it existed before Christianity even stepped onto the scene. The philosophers were already arguing about what happens when someone ascends or what happens, what, what's their body made of when, and so Platonic philosophy, that whole idea is that you're transcending your mortal body, that you're shedding it. This is a liberating moment. You don't want your body coming along. You don't, you're not becoming, you know, you don't want to become physical. You want to shed that as a, as an ideal. And so we see a lot of manifestations of that, even in, in Gnostic, Gnostic literature and elsewhere. And but Paul seems to be kind of in the stoic camp in a way where he, it, it doesn't sound like he's saying shedding it completely. It's transforming it. So there's a sense yeah. in which it's still going to have the body, but it's completely transformed. That's, it's different yeah. than the purely platonic one that you're saying that yeah, so that would be the platonic would be psychical. In other words, your soul is transcending the journey of the soul or whatever. Um, so that would be that concept. That's a little different than what Paul's. Paul's it's pneumatic. You know, it's a, it's spirit or wind. And so you know, you you were born, you were sown one kind of body and raised another. And so he's advocating for. Uh, uh, he's registering his own philosophical kind of place in that larger marketplace of this feud of what bodies are like. You know, after someone's died. So, mm. yeah. Thank you. I can't wait to be translated. <laughs> I hope you liked my dad, Richard Miller, in this interview. Remember to like and subscribe. And never forget, we are Miss Vision. Coming in the air tonight. Oh, Lord.